The Beach Boys' Wouldn't It Be Nice has a novel approach to young love. Released as the opening track for the 1966 album Pet Sounds, Brian Wilson, Tony Asher, and after a court case, Mike Love, penned a song that had a stark difference between musical complexity and straightforward lyrics. Brian, being fully aware of the need for commercial success, ventured towards the concept of two people falling in love, but instead of discussing what are they to do with each other in the moment, they lament, dream, and wonder about their future. Joyously hopeful, the song plays like a conversation many of us have had as we discuss the difficulties of falling in love at a young age. This is my love letter to Wouldn't It Be Nice. Okay, I thought we would begin with some nice graphics for the lyrics, but the melody is just so beautiful, I just had to sing it. Wouldn't it be nice if we were older, then we wouldn't have to wait so long. And wouldn't it be nice to live together in the kind of world where we belong. Wow. Wouldn't It Be Nice has some of the most longing lyrics I've ever heard and speaks directly and unapologetically about the burden of being apart from the one you love. Brian Wilson says, What children everywhere go through, wouldn't it be nice if we were older or we could run away and get married? Wouldn't It Be Nice was not a real long song, but it's a very up song. It expresses the frustration of youth, what you can't have, what you really want, and you have to wait for it. The song expresses the need to have the freedom to live with somebody. The idea is, the more we talk about it, the more we want it. But let's talk about it anyway. Let's talk it over. Let's talk about what we might have if we really got down to it. The lyrics truly do read like a conversation, especially when they go on to say, you know it seems the more we talk about it, it only makes it worse to live without it. But let's talk about it. Oh, wouldn't it be nice? And although the song's instrumentation and composition was charmingly complex, co-writer Tony Asher says, Brian was constantly looking for topics that kids could relate to, even though he was dealing in the most advanced score charts and arrangements. He was still incredibly conscious of this commercial thing, this absolute need to relate. However, Tony does continue to say, working with Brian and his eccentricities proved to be complicated. Tony says, it was a great joy making music with him, but that, like any other relationship with Brian, was a great chore. I find Brian's lifestyle so repugnant. I mean, to say every four hours we'd spend writing songs, there'd be about 48 of those dopey conversations about some book he just read. Or else he'd just go on and on about girls. His feeling about this girl or that girl, it was just embarrassing. I personally wouldn't mind talking to Brian Wilson about whatever he wants to talk about, but I can see how that can be difficult to get work done. It's intriguing Brian was so sensitive to what the public would enjoy, especially when he incorporated some very fun yet risky changes musically. For a pop song to even have a retardando before the bridge was pretty novel, but there were even more surprises. After Brian handed out the arrangement for Wouldn't It Be Nice, bassist Lyle Ritz noticed his assigned key was different than the rest of the musicians for the bridge. That would be pretty alarming for any musician, so of course Lyle thought it was done in error, but it wasn't. Brian is just a genius. Lyle says, The rest of the band was in another key. I knew that was wrong. So during a break, I looked at everybody else's music to see if it was a mistake. Because you can't do that. But Brian pulled it off. Pull it off, he did. Often when musicians get, now I don't know the right phrase for this, but change happy, the song can feel like it is meandering aimlessly, never really settling anywhere, leaving the listener uncomfortable. But Brian is a master of leading his listener, not to where they assume he wants to go, but where he knows they should. Take for example when it shifts keys from A major to F major after the intro. Although common in music, like jazz, this immediately surprises the listener, helping us to realize we're about to go on a bit of a harmonic adventure. I love stuff like that. That is exactly what I look for in a song. I want to be pleasantly surprised. When it comes to recording, oh boy. For as eccentric as Brian is, he's also reported to be incredibly detailed when it came to his music and its recording, even attaining the nickname Dog Ears by co-writer and singer Mike Love, who says, 
Brian must have been part canine because he was reaching for something intangible, imperceptible to most, and all but impossible to execute. And Beach Boy Bruce Johnson recalls how grueling the recording process was. Bruce says, we recorded our vocals so many times, but the rhythm was never right. We would slave at Western for a few days, singing this thing, and Brian would say, no, it's not right, it's not right. But Brian wasn't simply micromanaging his band, he was also incredibly helpful. Take for instance Brian's brother. Brian mentions Dennis Wilson was having trouble recording his vocals, so Brian lends him some interesting advice about cupping his hands over his mouth while he sang. Brian says, Well, he had a lot of trouble singing on mic. He just didn't really know how to stay on mic. He was a very nervous boy, very nervous person. So I taught him a trick how to record, and he said, Brian, that works great. Thank you. And I said, it's okay, Dennis. He was really happy. I showed him, not how to sing, but I showed him a way to get the best out of himself. Just cup singing. Brian Wilson, above all to me, is exactly the kind of composer and musician I hope to become one day. Settling for only the very best from himself and his bandmates, taking chances and striving to execute them perfectly. That is my love letter to Wouldn't It Be Nice. And now I'll leave you all with this beautiful quote from Brian that I'll read to you. Brian says, Listen for the rockin' accordions and the ethereal guitars in the introduction. Tony and I had visualized a scene. We had a feeling in our hearts like a vibration. We put it into music and it found its way onto tape. We really felt good about that record. If you enjoy these videos and want to support the channel, please consider becoming a patron. My videos will always be free and this is a great way to help me make them better for you. Check out my debut album, The Holly Hobbs, on Spotify and Apple Music, and click the like button, subscribe, and notification bell because that is the best way to get notified when a new video is released. See you next time.